Good afternoon and welcome to the Gerontological Society of America Academy for Gerontology and Higher Education webinar series on the Age-Friendly University Initiative. This series was made possible through a grant from the Retirement Research Foundation to the Academy for Gerontology and Higher Education for the Founders 3.0 project. This is the third and final webinar in the series and is titled, A Starting Point for Looking at Age Friendliness on My Campus. Aggie can help. I am Nina Silverstein, a professor of gerontology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and immediate past president of Aggie and former chair of the Social Research Policy and Practice section of GSA. I am joined by Marilyn Gallucci, a professor and director of geriatrics education and research at the University of New England. Marilyn is also a former president of Aggie and a former chair of the Health Sciences section of GSA. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website. A notice to all attendees will be distributed once the recording is available. A question and answer session will immediately follow today's live presentation. We will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the GoToWebinar panel. If the panel blocks your view of any of the slides, it may be helpful to click on the orange arrow in the top right to hide the panel until you wish to enter your questions. Many of you have participated in the previous two webinars. In webinar one, the faculty, Professors Joanne Montepari and Kimberly Farah, introduced the concept of age-friendly universities and described the growth of this movement that began in Dublin, Ireland in 2010. In webinar two, the faculty, Professors Carrie Andrea Letty and Andrea June, shared approaches various campuses have taken to apply to become a partner in the Age-Friendly University Global Network. The previous webinars have been archived and are available to you on the GSA website at the URL noted on the current slide. In webinar three, we address the now what? Once you are recognized as a member of the Age-Friendly University Global Network, how do you continue your AFU efforts at your institution? We hope to offer tips for you to consider by sharing our own experiences and providing additional examples of making the vision of AFU into a reality. To begin, what does it mean to be an age-friendly university and part of an AFU global network? It means that people on your campus are committed to working toward achieving the vision described in the 10 AFU principles listed in the handout attached to this and to the previous webinars. Just like the World Health Organization and AARP domains of age-friendly communities, where communities make a commitment to work toward demonstrating age-friendliness in each domain, a commitment to the AFU principles and joining the network means that your campus will commit to earnestly expanding its age-friendliness. How do you begin to explore methods to expand age-friendliness at your institution? My advice is to first find partners. I call this my Tom Sawyer approach. I'm having a good time, come join me, and then start anywhere or with the obvious low-hanging fruit. This webinar will provide examples from three different institutions that are currently looking at this issue. We'll provide time at the end of the webinar to discuss what was presented and field questions about methods for your own institutions. Who should care about AFU? We believe that everyone on campus should care. This is a list of departments, programs, and constituencies on my own campus that likely parallel what you might find on your campus. Who else might you add to this list? Start a list of your own and identify the leaders, change agents, and best contacts for each group. You know who they are. Start informal conversations to introduce the concept of AFU. If your campus is like mine, Aside from a small working group of faculty, students, staff, and a few administrators, no one else may know about AFU or that your campus is part of the AFU Global Network or what that means. We are now going to share some specific examples on what campuses have done since becoming an AFU partner. I am going to talk about the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Marilyn will share her experience at the University of New England and then relay the experience of our colleague Michelle Porter from the University of Manitoba. After the 2016 academic year of going through governance at the department, college, and upper administration levels, the University of Massachusetts Boston endorsed the principles of age-friendly universities in May 2017. During the immediate fall semester, 
I started talking to others about wanting to operationalize the principles and see where we were as a campus. I not only spoke to people on campus, but off campus as well. In November 2017, I spoke at our State Gerontology Association about a project I had in mind for spring 2018, specifically to develop an AFU audit. I was approached at that forum by a community leader who offered to work with us to achieve that aim. That leader was Andrea Weaver, who is the executive director of Bridges Together, an organization that focuses on intergen intergenerational engagement. Andrea became a welcome partner in our efforts. She had funding from the Tufts Health Plan Foundation to help build leadership teams and communities focusing on intergenerational engagement in their age-friendly community efforts. Andrea saw the Age-Friendly University Project as a natural opportunity for collaboration. It is noteworthy that our state organization, the Massachusetts Gerontological Association, is now an organizational member of the AFU network. Because this project was outside my faculty workload and did not have dedicated resources or funding, the first thing I did was to identify others who might want to work with me. I knew a project coordinator was critical, and for that position, I recruited a gerontology PhD candidate, Megan Hendrickson. I offered Megan a three-credit independent study. Beyond the academic credit, Megan was also a co-presenter at the GSA 2018 Annual Scientific Meeting AFU Symposium and a co-author for an article on our experience that is now available online pre-publication in the Gerontology and Geriatrics Education Special Issue on Age-Friendly Universities. Gerontology and Geriatrics Education is the official journal of AGI. Here is a timeline that breaks down steps you might consider. With Megan and a community partner already on board, in our first month, we recruited two other primary faculty members. The first was Susan Krauss Whitbourne, an emeritus professor from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a gerontology fellow on our UMass Boston campus and past chair of GSA's Behavioral and Social Sciences section. And the second faculty member was Lauren Marshall Bowen, an English professor who was recommended to me. Lauren does work on narrative gerontology but was previously not connected to our department. The AFU project is likely to connect you with faculty and staff from across campus who can relate to the concept once they understand it. And you'll also learn a lot of other faculty members and staff who are doing age-related uh, um, concepts or issues or um, certainly are interested in it. We then invited one of Lauren's graduate students from the English department, and also an undergraduate gerontology student, two lifelong learning members, an alum, and an older adult gerontology institute volunteer to join in our core working group. The group met for two intensive sessions designed to one, learn about intergenerational engagement, two, operationalize the 10 AFU principles by creating a series of quantifiable statements, three, identify contacts for each of the 20 stakeholder groups across campus that we described on the previous slide, and four, receive interviewer training. Work group members then conducted 19 in-depth interviews one person of our 20 had refused, using customized interview schedules with statements most appropriate for the office they represented. For example, the director of facilities was asked about physical access in the built environment, while the person from career services was asked about resources for students who are working on second careers. Here is a sample of an audit protocol item that related to principle four, and principle four was to promote intergenerational learning to facilitate the reciprocal sharing of expertise between learners of all ages. These are statements that emerged from our work group, which we used as a quasi-focus group to generate descriptive statements that would help operationalize the principles. The response set was agree, disagree, don't know, with an opportunity to elaborate. We're already working on a new edition of the audit and are considering using a Likert scale for statements of perception on the degree to which some activities might occur, such as how often faculty might integrate class projects or how often departments engage in intergenerational activities. There likely are a lot of data already available on your campus, but may not be retrieved in a way that is meaningful for beginning your exploration to expand the institution's effectiveness in operationalizing the AFU principles. We started by requesting data in a meaningful form from our Office of Institutional Research. That is, we, we requested age stratified data. We learned that in spring 2018, the time of our intended data collection, 3.5% of the UMass Boston student population was age 50 plus, or 544 students of whom 110 were age 60 or older. 
As I had first looked at older learners on the UMass Boston campus in 1998, I was surprised to see that the current number was a reduction of what I had observed prior. But I also understood that there was a policy change on fee waivers in 2004 that likely explained the reduction in part. So it is important to understand policies on tuition and fee waivers on your campus. In fact, there's about to be a change in policy on my campus that relates to online course tuition and fees, which may impact waivers available to older learners. So I will be watching for that. Other data that should be available, which I encourage you to collect, are on older faculty and staff members. It is not just about the older learners on campus, but the whole com campus community that comprise an age-friendly university. So what did we learn? Three major themes and 11 sub-themes emerged from our analysis and clustered around educational programming, accessibility, and inclusivity. Under educational, we observed that the achievement of an, an environment that fully supported intergenerational learning fell short at our UMass Boston campus, though comments by stakeholders suggest future potential in that area. Related to second career counseling, interviewees generally agreed that the campus has much to offer in resources and counseling on second careers. But where programs exist, the onus is on the individual to find them. And in other cases, the resources have not been packaged or designed to target this population. Resume building and job interview role playing targeted to first jobs likely need to be redesigned for the individual seeking assistance with second careers. In terms of accessibility, beyond physical and built environment concerns, the opportunity for expanding digital access was mentioned particularly in terms of increased tech support for novice learners entering the online environment. Inclusivity brought up issues of ageism and tokenism. The latter, an interesting insight to those stakeholders who believe that if a lifelong learning institute exists on your campus, you must be age friendly. Or we heard statements like, I once had an older person in my class, or there was that one time an older person came into the career office. So we, we coded those um, as, as tokenism. When we coded our themes by principle, you can see that our protocol statements weighed he more heavily on principles one, three, four, and eight. Interestingly, most all stakeholders interviewed were able to comment on principle one, which was to encourage the participation of older adults in all the core activities of the university, including educational and research programs. The frequent response was, our core activities are open to anyone. In our coding, we called this statement an open door. You're not going to be turned away, but we're not doing any special targeted outreach to bring you in either. In our work now, we are looking to identify protocol statements that better capture the other principles as well, such as those principles related to online educational opportunities, broadening research agendas, and understanding the longevity dividend and its relationship to potential opportunities for higher education. Our next steps are to, one, share short and long-term recommendations with higher administration, two, refine the audit to increase ease of use and replicability by other institutions, and three, collect data from a broader range of stakeholders using an e-survey format. For the next part of the webinar, Marilyn Gallucci will be presenting information from both her institution and another AFU institution. Please welcome Marilyn. Thank you, Nina. Hi, everyone. And Nina, I really want to thank you for providing a really fine example of stakeholder engagement and methods execution. So Nina's work as an AFU is truly quite advanced. My title at the University of New England is Professor and Director of Geriatrics Education and Research within the College of Osteopathic Medicine. As it turns out, which may be true for you as well, when issues and opportunities related to aging come up, my name seems to be mentioned. I have been at UNE since I've had black hair, and for those that can't see me, my hair is quite gray now. My longevity here and my passion in this field is known at UNE. The University of New England is a small private institution that is quite strong in health professions training. Currently, we have 16 programs dedicated to graduating health professionals. You will note that we have three physical campuses, two in Maine, one in Morocco. We have recently expanded to include a new designation, UNE North, that has collaborators in Paris, France, Norway, and in Iceland. The three focal areas where the energy and funding are going for UNE are one, interprofessional education, 
two, expansion of UNE North with the University of the Arctic, and three, aging. Our most recent addition at UNE is our UNE Center for Excellence in Aging and Health, funded by a UNE board member. The center founding director, Tom Muser, who came to UNE from Missouri, is traveling to Iceland this month, month to ensure pathways for aging with our UNE North affiliates. This is really a great time to be at UNE. To provide the backstory of our AFU designation, early on I created an underground group of faculty, 50 strong, across our five colleges who expressed an interest in aging. We do not have a gerontology program at UNE, but this group was instrumental in establishing aging, geriatrics and gerontology curriculum development as a priority in eight of our 16 health professions programs. They are the Physician Assistant Program, the College of Osteopathic Medicine, College of Pharmacy, all three nursing programs, Dental Hygiene Program, and the School of Social Work. We applied for AFU recognition in July 2017. With the help of this group of faculty, I conducted an assessment of what each program was doing in relation to the AFU principles and then drafted a letter for the UNE president. At that time, the president of 11 years was stepping down and a new president was just starting. It was the outgoing president who signed the letter with the endorsement of the incoming president. This in and of itself was instrumental in getting the incoming president on board to have aging be a UNE priority area. In the summer of 2017, we were the fifth higher education institution in the United States and the 11th higher education institution worldwide to be recognized as the age-friendly university global network. Our 2017 application for AFU status was impressive with 11 pages of initiatives across the institution. The initiatives were presented by college and then by education programs. You can see on this chart that presents the AFU principles and the UNE colleges that some address more of the AFU principles while other colleges clearly have gaps. The college that didn't respond when the initial assessment was conducted is the College of Graduate and Professional Studies. This college offers only online programs. For example, Masters of Public Health is part of this college and we had no idea in 2017 what they were doing that aligns with the AFU principles. We suspected that they would be a natural partner and have begun to work more closely with this program and this college in order to assess and expand our knowledge of which AFU principles apply across the college's programs. This chart reveals at a glance that we didn't meet all 10, F 10 AFU principles. Once we were recognized as an AFU, it was incumbent upon us to do what we can to address those principles where we had little impact. One major game changer for us was the implementation of the UNE Center for Excellence in Aging and Health, which started in September 2018. The center is focused on university-wide initiatives and thus far, many are aligned with the AFU principles. In this slide, the UNE Health Professions programs are listed on the left and the 10 AFU principles are listed across the top. This is our next step in identifying strategically how to implement the AFU principles within each program. Not all programs will embrace all principles, but as the UNE president has prioritized aging at the University of New England, doing an analysis of the various initiatives is imperative. The UNE takeaways in regard to this webinar include the following. We had a group of dedicated faculty who responded at a moment's notice to a call for information. It is incredibly important to nurture relationships, especially when there is a common cause and interest Age friendliness is a goal shared by enough of us to create change at UNE. Although the AFU application was impressive and was endorsed by the outgoing and incoming presidents, it's still a static document that reflects aging related initiatives that were in place in a period of time. The key questions are, how do we ensure that good work continues and how do we expand our age friendliness? We cannot rest on our laurels, especially when there is so much more to do. The third takeaway, the UNE AFU initiative and especially its expansion requires the many 
to be involved. UNE leadership commitment is one step. We are now trying to figure out how to get others on board with the AFU Global Network designation. The older adults in our community are actually more excited about this than our fellow UNE community colleagues. Dissemination of projects using the AFU logo and consistently bringing the AFU designation forward is essential. There is no question that UNE community feels proud of its leadership globally. The next example is the Photo Voice project led by Professor, Mich Professor excuse me, Michelle Porter at the University of Manitoba. Photo Voice is a qualitative method used for community-based participatory research to identifying and represent an issue of importance by sharing photos and telling stories. Professor Porter instructed participants to take pictures of barriers and facilitators inside and outside, not limited to physical attributes. She then conducted a focus group where all the photos were discussed. That led to a summary report that was shared with the administration. Here is an example where the university website is difficult to navigate and visually is not very age friendly. The font is very small with little contrast. At Manitoba, classes are free to older adults. And yet the one place this information is listed, the website is not older adult friendly. Another example where photo voice captured a challenge is this elevator. It is clearly not wide enough to allow wheelchair access. There is a need for retrofitting in some of the older buildings at this university. Clearly, this would be a high cost item to address, but knowledge of challenging areas could assist with where to schedule classes and meetings that are held if older adults are participants. Some takeaways from the Manitoba experience include taking photographs is an empowering experience and quite informative. As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Photos are effective in getting across the AFU message. Prioritize the suggestions from those that are more easily doable to those that are more challenging to address due to funding or other policy and infrastructure issues. The suggestion here is to approach administrators with low hanging fruit issues to get the initial buy-in. There are a number of GSA AGI resources available to support the AFU process. I will present them in no particular order. The mission of the AGI Academic Program Development Committee, referred to as the APDC, is to plan, implement, and facilitate mechanisms that assist academic institutions to develop, strengthen, and improve their gerontology, geriatrics, and aging studies instructional programs. This is an open committee, meaning that anyone who is a member of GSA AGI can join and participate. It was the APDC leadership that created the opportunities and support for the GSA AGI programs to engage with the age-friendly university movement. Within the APDC, there are two programs available to any academic program, regardless of AGI membership. Although AGI membership offers fee discounts and greater connection to related resources and colleagues. The first is the AGI Program of Merit for Gerontology and Health Professions Programs that provides a globally recognized, voluntary, external evaluation process in gerontology and health professions education. The Gerontology Program of Merit was established in the late 1990s, and the Health Professions Program of Merit was established in 2017. The review processes are supportive, informative, and respected by institutional administrative leadership, along with program directors and coordinators. The review is based on the AGI standards and guidelines that includes the AGI gerontology competencies, as well as the American Geriatric Society and the Partnership for Health and Aging Competencies for Health Professions programs. The links to these resources are offered on the next slide. The second program is the AGI Consultation Program. The proactive service supports educational institutions with meeting the demographic aging imperative, which requires innovative and contemporary gerontology, geriatrics instruction, and program development. 
the needs of the institutional program drives the consultation possibilities. For example, if you receive grant funding to conduct an institutional review for age friendliness, you could reach out to the Yagi Consultation Program for assistance in conducting this review. There is no limit to the Yagi Consultation Program in supporting gerontology and health professions education and evaluation. As mentioned in the previous slide, here is the information for the Yagi Standards and Guidelines Document 2015 edition. It includes the Augie Gerontology Competencies, the Partnership in Health and Aging Competencies for Health Profession Students, and the American Geriatric Society Competencies for Medical Students. To continue with the GSA Augie resources available to support the AFU process, the next area of support through Augie is the camaraderie of Augie members who are recognized members of the AFU Global Network. True to Augie's culture, we provide peer-to-peer -peer support and assistance. Reaching out to any Augie member who has already attained an AFU designation will offer you a variety of options for support, depending on whom you contact. For instance, I have offered to share our letter of application as a guide to those interested in applying for AFU status. Talking with those who have gone before you is always helpful in paving the way and picking up helpful hints. New in 2019 is the establishment of the AFU Interest Group that will meet for the first time at the GSA annual meeting in Austin, Texas, November 2019. This interest group will meet the needs of those who attend by sharing ideas, opening up discussions, providing resources from other institutions to advance the AFU principles, and supporting AFU efforts. It will be a good way to meet those who are also interested in the AFU movement. Lastly, for Augie Resources, there is a special issue of Gerontology and Geriatrics Education, Augie's official journal on age-friendly universities. Here you see a sample of some articles that are currently available online and will be in the special issue that will be available in April. Reaching out to any of the authors is highly encouraged. So this concludes our prepared comments. Before we begin the question and answer portion of this webinar, Mina and I would like to acknowledge the support of the Retirement Research Foundation for funding the AFU webinar series. We also want to thank Joanne Montepar from LaSalle College, who is the principal investigator on this grant. And we definitely thank the GSA Augie staff, especially Judy Liu, for her technical expertise in making these webinars user-friendly, and support from Gina Schoen, Augie Program Manager. Our emails are listed on this slide. We sure hope to hear from you. Judy, I will turn this over to you to begin the discussion. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Nina. All right, so we are at that point in the webinar to field questions and engage in discussion. So please type and send your questions using that question feature that's accessible on the right side of your screen. All right, here is one. Um, how do you disseminate your AFU information around your university or campus? Uh, Judy, thank you for the question. This is Nina. I'll start and then Marilyn could add on. Um, I think that's a great question um, and there's so much that uh, that uh, one could do and admittedly um, on my campus we have not um, done as much as I would like to yet. So where would I, uh, where would I start? Well, um, how about a press release? Um, a press release that would go to the external community. And then um, a memo where your higher administration actually before the press release to external, why don't you let the rest of the campus know uh, what was going on? So a memo from higher administration to the full campus community uh, would, be, would be good. Uh, I think that we could be doing more to use the logo on the institutional website. Uh, I think it would be a great uh, recruiting uh, tool to, uh, to, uh, to define yourself as an age-friendly university, um, helpful in terms of uh, student recruitment and, um, and, and workplace recruitment for faculty. Um, what else? Um, I think that um, uh, um, uh, have semester announcements of what AFU related happenings are happening, our, our events might be happening, um, promoted it through campus newspaper articles, 
or internal news uh, notices. Lately in gerontology, we've been doing a lot of um, you know blogs and uh, and Q and A's. Maybe um, you know having uh, doing doing a, a news release or something, doing in a Q and A format on what does it mean to be an age friendly university. And I understand our campus is one um, that might be helpful. I also heard about um, campuses that are considering developing uh, an award program, a recognition of AFU efforts. Um, I think that's a great idea. Uh, create um, an opportunity uh, for an award. Maybe it's um, what what is one thing that you can look at at your campus as is, uh, is, is best practice in, in terms of age friendly and uh, promote it and then uh, have a ceremony to award and then an article following up on that. Um, Let's see, Marilyn, do you want to add some more to that? Yeah, so I'm definitely going to agree with everything that Nina is saying. And um, in terms of, uh, I usually call it a termite revolution, where we're kind of chewing on people's kneecaps to make change here. And I think one of the biggest uh, pluses for us is that uh, I, I scripted um, just a brief intro statement for our president, and he always mentions our AFU designation in any group setting that he's in. And I have been just so appreciative of that. And the reason for the scripting started because um, I think he just, he didn't quite have the full message or didn't quite understand the full message and, and scripting something for any of the leaders in your school in terms of what exactly it is. And, and it has to be brief, right? It has to be the elevator speech. Uh, but I think it really helps. So taking the initiative to do that. Our president is also coming to, we are having our 29th annual Maine Geriatrics Conference in June. And our president is invited to that and will be speaking about the age-friendly university uh, de uh, global network designation there as well. The smaller items uh, that I don't believe Nina mentioned was, and she did mention the use of the AFU logo, but in every class that I teach or every presentation that I do, I always have that on there. And I'm always talking about it with the students, fellow faculty, and those constant reminders are so important. What I expect here is that as we're moving forward to address more of those age-friendly principles and we're engaging more of, a, more of our programs, such as the online programs, uh, and really trying to broaden our reach with these principles, then we get buy-in from the faculty and that will help change the tide and move this forward a whole lot faster. Great, thank you. Um, Here's another question. Um, how can we ensure that faculty, staff, um, students, um, retirees know what it means to be an AFU? Judy, thank uh, I thank our participants for that question as well. I think that's um, that's really you know it's 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 one thing to get the designation, but you don't want to be invisible about it. Um, so I think that. Uh, to there's got to be a, a champion, and I, I, I look at uh, um, our gerontology faculty perhaps as uh, as as being those champions to um, instigate uh, um, action on our, our campuses. And I think that one thing that I would uh, I think would be important to do would be to conduct um, a, a public relations campaign on campus about AFU. Uh, and I certainly noticed in our in our process of doing the audit. I think the process of doing the audit and interviewing people one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, across our campus, the conversations that emerged, getting people thinking, by the questions we asked, getting them to, uh, to think about it more. Um, you know, I, we, saw, we saw light bulbs clicking, that people were, were starting to get the idea. So it's that um, it might be slow, and I liked uh, Marilyn's analogy to uh, termites um, that uh, you know it's it, it, it could be a, a slow I hopefully not a not a painful process but um, but getting you know having that engaging our colleagues one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one to um, to kind of uh, um, get the idea um, and and doing doing such in doing doing such an audit or mapping uh, is one way another idea I had um, I think that we should be offering professional development 
uh, and stipends to faculty and staff uh, to create things such as um, instructional planning for an intergenerational classroom or a pedagogical approach to the longevity dividend or supporting and advising on second careers. I mean, I think that these are uh, the type of content areas or workshops that we could be offering through, uh, that campuses could be offering through uh, professional development. Um, and I think that that would definitely be an area to, that would help um, move, move things along in terms of infusing the AFU principles across the campus. Um, Marilyn, do you want to add to those? Well, I, I'm just going to say one thing, Nina, and for us, we are a small university. And uh, what really was uh, changed the playing field for us was getting that board donation to start up a Center for Excellence in Aging and Health. So for those of you that do not have such a center, and ours is clinical research focused or participatory research focused, um, find, find a sugar daddy out there. Find somebody with a lot of money that can help really push that along. And I don't mean to sound flip about that, but it is interesting how at the University of New England, all of this came together at the same time to really make that shift and to um, convince really the UNE leadership that we should even be bringing this across the globe at our UNE North site. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those termites, they can pull down a whole house just by chewing on the wood, right? frame so I think okay. it really is just you know a little at a time and it and momentum will build as Nina stated you know I would also I would also add that uh, how how can we get this sustainable and, and across our campuses and and I think the way to do it I know that so many of us you know one thing we do certainly is to sit on committees and how many strategic planning committees and master plan committees have uh, you know have you sat on how do you start infusing these principles within the strategic plans I think that that would be one way to um, you know uh, to to assure that uh, that this is just not um, uh, something that's uh, that's time sensitive, but that it, it will be lasting. So I encourage you to do that. And then, of course, um, you know who who has the most energy on our campus? It's it's our students and our student organizations and clubs. So how do we get them? You know, can't uh, we as uh, faculty advisors to to so many student groups? Can we suggest, particularly like uh, one one example would be um, in terms of Sigma Phi Omega or Gerontology Honor Society or other groups uh, to uh, to think about holding an event specifically in terms of age friendly university awareness? So that's that that would be a final idea that I would suggest. Great, thank you. And here are a couple of questions surrounding sort of. How can your institution capitalize on being um, an AFU and sort of related questions tied to that, um, you know, uh, as a busy uh, faculty member, um, you know, any suggestions on how to, to move it forward and sort of convincing colleagues um, uh, since, since the faculty uh, member in particular doesn't have resources to begin, um, but feels that it's necessary for their university? Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Um, thank you for that question as well. Uh, I, I noted in my presentation that, um, that this was outside my, my workload and that it was something that um, I knew that I could not, well, I don't, I, I prefer working in collaboration anyway, but um, I had to think through uh, creatively uh, what could I do to, um, you know, to help uh, to get others uh, aboard? And um, and the first thing that I was able to do, and uh, I, I hope that others are able to do to do that as well, who lead um, independent directed study, uh, to be able to get a graduate student to uh, to work with you on, on on the project. Having that project coordinator really um, is is helpful, whether it's to do uh, a research or hold an event or to do something like that. Um, I think that. I believe that uh, that just as aging is good business, I think age-friendly university is good business. I think that um, that the campuses really need to understand or uh, we need to relay more. What does this longevity dividend mean for higher education? Um, I think that it's not just a 
a good thing to do, I think it makes sense to do. I mean, one thing that I discovered in my research in the late 90s about older learners on campus was that they were spending money in the bookstore. They were spending money um, in the cafeterias. They were uh, engaging, uh, um, you know, uh, they were enriching our, our communities. It's not a question of what are we just, you know, doing for older adults who are on our campus community. It's, um, you know, how are they enriching the university environment? So I think it's, 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 it's a culture change, and I think that uh, they need to be uh, looking a little bit more um, in that in that way. I also, uh, Marilyn had mentioned, and others have mentioned in the previous webinars too, um, the availability of uh, grants, um, however small or or big. Um, I think that this is a concept that there's. There's no stigma attached to this this concept. I mean, this is just a positive thing. Who could be against wanting a, a campus to be um, age friendly? So I think that uh, that that is something that uh, you know that you could. Um, it's how you present yourself and how you approach it. Um, yeah, um, uh, faculty are busy, but like anything else, uh, it's those busy faculty who get more done. And uh, just to find others that uh, um, to define the projects in such a way that is something that people want to do and to um, to make it that it's a time limited thing that they could uh, engage in this group this work group that I uh, that we created uh, for this audit um, I have the five principal faculty members uh, or five of us um, who are willing to continue this on to uh, this next year in terms of trying to revise this uh, this audit that we've developed so um, people are um, well people are passionate but people are also trying to uh, realistically come up with the a time frame to uh, to actually get something done. Um, Marilyn, anything else? Yeah, I, I mean, the champion, I think, is critical. And uh, for many of us, when we've been together at Augie meetings, uh, how often have we said, you know, I'm, I'm standing alone in my institution and really trying to move this um, a, the agenda on aging forward. So, um, so we do clearly have a passion and do clearly take on more than is in our job description. But I'll tell you, here at UNE, getting that underground kind of connection with those 50 faculty across, at that time, five colleges was critical. Uh, it made us very responsive. And it, uh, as now that we have a Center for Excellence in Aging and Health, age-friendly university designation, the president is supporting aging, now those faculty are flourishing. They have come out where before we were kind of just hiding in the corner, you know, and have this, you know, emails going and trying to figure out. We were calling ourselves an institute for optimal aging, even though it wasn't recognized by the university. So that's, that's critical, those partnerships within your institution. The other thing for us, I mentioned we have 16 health professions programs. That's what we're known for. And with health professions programs, our students are always out in the community. And aging is really a hot topic in terms of, of care, health care, medical care. So um, those community partnerships and, and the community work that our students do aside from internships and, and clerkships and rotations and those things, uh, we're doing a lot with age-friendly uh, communities. So connecting with AARP then gets us back to the faculty for having these other outlets to engage their students. So it, it all kind of comes around to, uh, as Nina mentioned, collaboration, partnerships, but it's got to start with one person, I'm sorry to say, and, it, and that person has to have a lot of passion. Great, thank you. And, and tying to that, uh, there are a couple of questions coming in around, you know, what real suggestions do you have for starting conversations with high-level leaders and um, questions such as, you know, what are you willing to share your elevator speech for leadership? Um, and there are um, some other questions around, um, you know, those examples, sharing the materials um, and and how and when they'll be available so that they can you know re replicate. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in on that, Nina, first because sure. I, I just want to say I am happy to share whatever. And I think what really kicked it off here was uh, talking to the at that time the outgoing president and saying we have an opportunity to 
and again, remember, we're a small institution, right, small university, to be recognized as a leader in the field of aging. There were pockets of that already within the university. And so, the, and I, I have to tell you, I have to fess up, the president that we had at that time was a self-proclaimed gerontologist. Uh, she, her work, her research was done on the speech patterns of people with dementia uh, before early in her career. And she just kind of really embraced gerontology. So having that kind of support was really important. Uh, the president we have now, his background is psychology, um, still seems to understand the importance of aging and the demographic imperative and the longevity dividend. So those are all helpful for us. But when I pulled together with the team of everything we were doing already, I think that in and of itself spoke volumes to get the leadership's attention. Because if you think about it, they're doing big picture stuff. They're not in the weeds. They don't really know what's happening in our programs. And when we can pull all that together and put it into one document, that got their attention. And I would say that's truly a starting place for for getting leadership attention. Uh -huh. uh, bringing it up into any faculty forums that you have, you know, we have a faculty assembly. Uh, I think that's also important to start there with your fellow faculty. Uh -huh. Nina? Yes, no, thank you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I go back to the phrase that aging is good business and that um, uh, talking to administrators, uh, showing them the data on their campus in a way that they haven't looked at the data on their campus. Talk to them about, the older learners that are already um, in all degree programs and uh, degree programs and professional certificate programs and um, even if you have I mean I want us to get away from we have an OSHA lifelong learning or a lifelong learning Institute on our campus therefore we are age-friendly no there's a lot more to it than than we have a lifelong learning Institute um, on our campus uh, how do you infuse um, uh, age-friendly uh, um, principles across the curriculum. Um, I think that uh, in terms of uh, um, recruitment um, of students, recruitment of how to, to even, I think the under, an underserved uh, area too is um, uh, older faculty and staff, okay? How do we, uh, how do we keep people, um, uh, accommodate uh, individuals uh, who want to work longer um, and, and in ways, how do we, I mean, I think the online environment really presents a, a wonderful opportunity there. How is that more accessible? So to make those kind of uh, connections, uh, I think would be, would, be, would be great. I also encourage you, this discussion also came up in webinar two, so to listen to the archive of that uh, was very good in terms of um, specifically uh, how do you uh, speak to administrators to, uh, to do that. Um, with us, we started with our faculty, uh, our gerontology faculty. We had, do have a gerontology department. We then went on to our dean, uh, the college level, um, who then presented it to, uh, to the higher administration. Of course, in our situation, uh, the higher administration, both the chancellor and the provost that, uh, that endorsed, um, then both uh, left our campus. And so we didn't have this great uh, handoff, as Marilyn described. And I had to let our new chance, new interim chancellor and new provost know about uh, about this, um, so that that you know that communication is uh, is 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 huge. But what can we do to keep the momentum going? And I think that that's um, you know something that we just have to um, be uh, ubiquitous across uh, to to make sure that, uh, that that we keep this momentum going. And it's one thing to be the champion, but it's another thing to uh, have other people embrace the concept too so that you that you are not the only one uh, carrying the ball on this. And I think, okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, that's, that's it. Okay. Um, got a couple of questions just asking for clarification about the PowerPoint slides. And so I just want to confirm for everyone on the call that on the webinar that a copy will be provided after this live offering. Um, and you'll find it on uh, the GSA website right next to uh, the link to the recording. So it, it will be made available. Okay, I think this might be our last question. Um, uh, what role can community partnerships play in advancing AFU? 
Um, I think that that's a great question, and I think we should be making a greater connection between the age-friendly community movement and the um, age-friendly university movement. Um, I think that uh, you know that there's the connections are just a, a, a natural that we would see um, uh, on our campuses in terms of, of of the role that we can play in uh, in in addressing those issues those domains of uh, age friendly communities as well but i also said that i started off saying unbeknownst to me by doing by sharing with uh, the community at least through our mass gerontology association forum um, it was uh, uh, that's that's what brought me to um, you know a wonderful uh, community advocate uh, in terms of uh, Andrea Weaver and Bridges Together, the international uh, intergenerational uh, engagement um, group that uh, that said, oh, you know, we we want to work with you. So um, you know, don't be uh, uh, don't uh, don't do this in in secret. There are a lot of people who would be really be interested. And I also refer you back then to uh, to um, uh, this webinar too, uh, where uh, Carrie and Andrea, in talking about their work in uh, Connecticut, uh, really have a strong um, involvement with their uh, with the local with the local community as well. So I think that they had some really good ideas in that webinar that would be helpful to respond to that question uh, too. Marilyn, anything to add? Nope, nothing to add. I think you did a great job, Nina. Thank you. Okay. So, Excellent. Well, Marilyn and Nina, thank you. It's been a real pleasure learning about the AFU movement, and thanks to everyone for participating. Um, this webinar will be available on the website, um, so please check it out if you want to review it again in a future time or share it with others. And um, please, you know, we, we ask for your feedback, too, on the webinar. That's very important to us. Um, a survey will automatically launch after we end the program, so in an effort of continue improvement, we'd like to hear from you. Um, so please provide feedback by clicking on that link. This is the end of the webinar.